Hello and welcome to Controllers Tech. Today we will continue with our project, where we were interfacing the dot matrix display with SDM32. In the previous video we saw how to connect a single dot matrix display via the SBI, how to figure out the correct configuration for it, and finally how to display the numbers and characters on it. Today we will cover how to cascade multiple displays together. This is how the four dot matrix displays are cascaded together. All the connected displays will be powered from the same VCC and ground pins. We also have the common data, CS, and clock pins for all of them. When used in cascade mode, the display where the input pins are available, is treated as the last in number. So this is the fourth display, this is the third, second, and the one on the rightmost end is the first one. In the previous video we saw how my display was accepting the data. This particular row is the column 1 register. Then column 2, column 3, and this row is the column 8 register. If we continue going with this logic, then this is column 9, column 10, and this makes the last row as column 32. Although there is no such thing as column 9 register. So column 9 is basically the column 1 of the second display. Column 16 is column 8 of the second display. Similarly, columns 17 to 24 are the columns 1 to 8 of the third display, and columns 25 to 32 are the columns 1 to 8 of the fourth display. When we will write the data in these cascaded displays, we will write it like this. Now there is no issue with writing data in this manner, but the issue might appear while scrolling. To keep things simple, I am going to call them rows from now onwards. Let's assume that these two LEDs in the last row are set. To scroll this data to the left, we need to reset the first LED, and turn on the other one. Since our data is written as per these rows, we have to do it individually for each row. This can be done by shifting the data for each row to the right by one place. Well this is because our lower data is towards the left side. Still it is manageable to do it for all the rows. But when the scrolling will cross the boundary, it will be hard to manage. We need to remember the previous state of the first LED, and then modify the last LED in the next display. Now imagine doing it for the entire column of all the displays. I am not saying it is not possible, it is just a lot of work. Instead of doing it row-wise, we can achieve it easily by arranging the data in columns. Let's say we have some data in this column. To scroll the data to the left, all we need to do is, copy the content of this column to the other one. Then again copy it to further left. When we do it multiple times, it will have an effect that the entire column is scrolling left. To arrange the data in the column form, we will define a buffer of 32 bytes, where each column will store a data byte for the particular column. Here is the previous project we worked on, so let's continue to modify it. We will first define the number of devices we have cascaded. Then define a column buffer to store 8 bytes per device. These 8 bytes will contain the data for 8 columns. This way we have a buffer, which can store the data for all the LEDs on the cascaded display. Before we go ahead with the ways of writing the data, let's see how to initialize the displays. This is the initialization function from the previous tutorial. But now we have 4 different displays, so the initialization needs to be done for all of them. The way we do it is, we send the same command to all the four of them. This part in the function, where the 16-bit data is sent, we call it four times. Note that the CS pin will go high only after the command has been sent to all the displays. This way, the command is latched to all the displays. Let's rename these functions. So, there is no change in the initialization sequence, except that we need to send the same command to all the connected displays. Alright sending command is easy, but the data is not sent like this. 
this part is going to be a little confusing, so pay attention. Even though we are storing the data in the column form, the data still needs to be sent in the rows. This is how my display accepted it in the previous tutorial, and this can't be changed. Now our first concern is, changing the row data to the row form. The next issue here is, even if we manage to change the data into the row form, how will we write the data to the 15th row, or 20th row? We know that the rows are numbered between 1 to 8, and it is the same for all the four devices. Here is the actual data sheet of the MAX 7219. If you take a look at the registers, you will notice that we have covered all the registers, starting from 1 to 15, except the register 0. The register at the address 0, is the no operation register, and it is specifically used in the cascade mode. Here is an example of how to use this register. Let's assume that we want to write some data to a particular row or column of the fourth device. Then we need to first send three no operation commands, and then send the data word for the fourth device. All this must be done when the CS pin is still low. When the pin goes high, the first three devices receive the no operation command, and the fourth device will receive the data. Let's write a function to handle this. The max write function takes two parameters, the row number, which can range from 1 to 32, and the data byte. Inside this function we will first calculate the target device based on the row number. Looking at the device picture again, this is row 1, row 8, row 9, row 16, and let's say that we want to write the data to row 18. This row 18 is actually row 2 in device 2. This calculation will give us the output 2, indicating the target device. Then offset is basically the row from where the data bytes for the target device is starting. In this example, the offset will be 16, as this is where the device number 2 starts. Then we will pull the CS pin low, and send the data to all the 4 devices. If the device is the target device, then we will send the actual data word, otherwise send the no operation command. For the target device, we will first prepare the 16-bit word, which consists of the row address and the data itself. The row minus offset will be 2 in this example, and this is exactly where we want to write the data. This for loop will run as many times as the number of devices we have defined, so the other devices can receive the no cooperation command. Finally, when the CS pin is pulled high, the data or no operation commands will be latched in the respective devices. We will quickly test this before proceeding ahead. Inside the main function, initialize the display. Then call the max write function to send some data to the 18th row. Here I am sending the data 0 to some other rows, so that the data in the 18th row is easily identified. Let's build and flash it to the board. Ignore the data on the rest of the devices, as they will receive no operation commands, so there will be no change in them. Note that row 17, and from 19 to 22, all are zeros, and row 18 has the data we sent. We sent the data 47 hex, and this is exactly what we have on this row. Let's try sending the data 53 hex to row 19. You can see that we have got the data on the row as expected. Let's try displaying the data on all these rows. We have got the data, just as we entered in the respective row. So everything works as expected, the max write function is able to write the data to the respective row. As I mentioned earlier, we will focus on writing the data column-wise, so that it will be easier for us to scroll it. But the issue is that the device accepts the data according to rows, and not columns. So we need to convert the column data to row form. Let's open our character generator again. This time we will configure it with column major, and big endian. Now let's draw the number 3 on it, and generate the data for it. The data is in the column form, starting with this column here. This is column 1, and it has the data 0. 
Then column 2 has the data 22 hex, which is arranged from bottom to top. You can understand it better with the third byte, 41 hex. The first four bits are 1, and the last four bits are 4. So two things are clear from here, the columns are increasing from left to right, and the data bytes are arranged from bottom to top. But we will send the data in such a way that the columns should increase from right to left. Doing it is simple, we just need to send the data in the descending order, with the most significant byte sent first. This picture shows how our data is going to be. The columns will increase from right to left, but the data is big endian, so it will be arranged from bottom to top. One thing that is fixed is that the device accepts the data in the row form, and the order will be from left to right. So now we need to change our column data to the row form. To do that, we will take the first column, extract its zeroth bit, and store it in the seventh position of row 1. Then extract the first bit of column 1, and store it in the seventh bit of row 2. Then the second bit of column 1 will be placed, to the seventh position of row 3. This way, the entire column 1 will be extracted, and placed to the seventh position of all the rows. Then we will extract the bits from column 2, and place them on the sixth positions of all the rows. That is how all the column data will be converted to the row data, which can be then sent to the display. Here is the flush buffer function, which will flush the entire column buffer to the display. Inside this function we will define a new row buffer, where the converted data will be stored. We have 32 rows in total, therefore this buffer will also be 32 bytes of data. This function has two jobs. It will first convert the column data buffer to the row buffer. And then it will send the row buffer to the display. Let's understand the conversion part, as it is going to be a bit more complex. Here we will call a for loop for all the 32 bytes of the column data. I will explain this part in a while. Now we will call another for loop to extract each bit from the data byte. Now we will take the first column to extract the data from. In this column, we will read the zeroth bit, which is this one right here. Then we take the first row of the row buffer, and store the extracted bit at the seventh position. Ignore the rest of the things mentioned here, I will explain them in a while. So we are storing the zeroth bit of the first column to the seventh bit of the first row. Now the j will increment to 1. We are still working on the first column, and now we will extract the bit 1 of this column. It is this bit right here. The j value is 1 so row 2 is selected, and we will store the bit into the 7th position of this row. This loop will run till the j value is 7, and we have extracted all the bits from column 1, and stored them at the 7th positions of all the rows. Now I will increment to 1, and column 2 will be selected. Here we will extract the 0th bit, and store it at the 6th position of row 1. This is where this i comes into the picture, since the value of i is 1, 7 minus 1 will be 6. So we will extract all the bits from column 2, and store them at the 6th positions of all the rows. Then I will increment to 2, and we will extract the bits from column 3, and store them at the 5th positions of all the rows. Similarly, when i will be 7, column 8 will be extracted, and the bits will be stored at 0th positions of all the rows. This will complete the extraction of all the data for the first device. Now we will start extracting the columns of the second device. When i will be equal to 8, we will be extracting the ninth column. This value of device will be equal to 1. The dev is 1, and i is 8, hence the i minus 8 will give us 0, and we are basically storing again at the 7th positions, but the rows are from 9 to 16 this time. So this is how this entire loop will work, and we will basically convert all the column data to the row form. Note that the data stored in the row form start from element 0, but the device expects the address from 1, therefore the address is passed from 1, but the data starts from element 0. 
We are calling the max write function to pass the address and data. It will then pass the row data to the target device, and no operation to the rest of them. Let's test if we are able to use the data column wise. I will display this number, which is arranged in column major, and big endian form. Let's copy this array to our main file. We need to pass the data from the end, because this is how we have programmed the rest of the things. But the data generated here is starting from this row. So when storing the data into the column buffer, we will start storing from the seventh byte. Also note that I am storing the data into the first eight bytes of the column buffer, so we will see the data in the first device only. Now call the function flush buffer to flush the column buffer to all the displays. Let's also write a function to clear the display. Inside this function, we will write zeros to all the bytes in the buffer. And then call the function flush buffer to flush these zeros to the display. Let's clear the display after initialization, so that we only have the number 3 on the display. Alright let's build and flash it to the board. You can see the number 3 is being displayed on the first device. The rest of the devices are blank, as we cleared the display after initialization. So storing the data in a column buffer works well. We will not display this number in the middle of the device, so that half of it will display on the second device. This is to check if the data is able to cross the device boundary or not. Here I am displaying it starting from column 6. Let's flash it to the board. We didn't quite get what we were expecting here. This is because the i value is greater than 7, and hence there are issues because of it. Let's define another index variable with the start value of 0, and we will pass it instead of the i value. Alright let's flash it again to the board. You can see the number 3 is being displayed on two separate devices now. So the column data is able to cross the device boundary without any issues. We were able to display the data according to the columns. This will be helpful in the next video, where we will scroll the data on these devices. We will program the functions to scroll a single character, and an entire string. This is it for the video. You can download the project from the link in the description. Leave comments in case of any doubt. Keep watching, and have a nice day ahead.